Good morning, Freedom Church. So great to be with you today. You know, I'm excited because God is always at work. We are in a series titled The Good News. Don't you love good news? I love good news. But I've noticed something. You know, many times good news doesn't actually feel like good news at the moment. I remember when I was applying for graduate programs and I got rejected by all of them except for one. Now, that didn't feel very good in the moment. But do you know that's why I'm here today? That that's what God used to get me into the mission that he had for me? Sometimes good news just doesn't feel like good news in the moment. Now, the reverse can also be true. We can hear something that sounds like fantastic news to us, but because we don't do anything with it, it doesn't become good news for us. You know, most of the time, news is just news until we do something about it. News is just news until we do something about it. That's the big idea that we're going to unpack today. So we're going to begin in just one verse, Mark chapter 4. Consider carefully what you hear, Jesus continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you. Father, I thank you that you are at work right now. God, I thank you that there is hope for every one of us because you are the living God, full of grace, full of mercy, full of kindness. And Lord, you're ready to meet us right now. Lord, I pray that you would freshly fill us up with your Holy Spirit. God, today will you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to believe, all that you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if we're going to navigate life in a healthy way, we've got to come to terms with two big realities. Here's the first one. Almost everything in this life is outside of your control. Almost everything in this life is outside of your control. Now, if you didn't believe that before the pandemic, pretty sure you believe it now, right? Almost everything in this life is outside of our control. All right, pop quiz. Raise your hand if you got to choose how you were parented growing up. Yeah, anybody? No, none of us, right? What about your ethnicity? What about the house that you grew up in? What about the elementary school that you went to? What about the teachers that you had or the coaches that you had or the neighbors that you had? I mean, most of us didn't get to choose basically any of the most significant influences during our formative years. Now, even as adults, almost everything is outside of our control. You know, there's something like 7.6 billion people on this planet. Do you know how many of them you can control? None. We can't control anybody else, which is actually kind of a frightful thought every time I get on the road, right? I'd like to be able to control what everybody else is doing, but I can't do it. I can't control the economy. I can't control the job market. I can't control the weather. I can't even control whether or not my favorite team wins. That's so disheartening, right? I mean, I would like to think that the huge emotional investment I'm making into my team makes a big difference of whether they win or lose, but probably not. Almost everything is outside of our control. That can feel a little depressing until we remember the second great reality. The part of your life that you do control is by far the most important. The part of your life that you do control is by far the most important. Jesus told his disciples, consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Now, what did Jesus mean by this? The saying actually shows up in three of the four gospels, the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, and the gospel of Luke. Each time, there's a slightly different application. And in fact, sayings like this were relatively well known among rabbis in Jesus' day. And the main idea of these sayings is relatively simple. It's the principle of reciprocity. What you put into something determines what you get out of it. What you put into something determines what you get out of it. Now, I can already feel some of you protesting against this idea just a little bit, right? Maybe you're thinking, that's not true. 
People get a raw deal all the time. You don't always get out of something what you put into it. And you know what? You're right. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't get treated fairly. This happens to us usually all throughout our lives, sometimes in really huge ways. In fact, the psalmists often cry out in despair because of the injustices that they're experiencing. So I agree with you. The principle of reciprocity oftentimes feels like it's not valid. So let me give you a slightly more nuanced version. The principle of reciprocity is true in the world sometimes, with the people that we are closest to frequently, and with God always. The principle of reciprocity is true in the world sometimes, with the people that we are close to frequently, and with God always. Now, notice that Jesus uses the passive voice when he makes his statement about this principle. He says, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, this is known as a divine passive. And what Jesus means here is, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you by God. Now, don't miss this. See, in our broken world, wisdom sayings like this one rarely hold true 100% of the time. And because of that, we can be really tempted to just throw out the principle altogether. I mean, maybe we think, I've given to people and experienced nothing in the return. I've worked hard with no payoff. I've loved people who didn't reciprocate my love. We've all experienced this. Even so, just because this principle doesn't hold all the time does not mean it's a good idea to just throw it out altogether. I mean, haven't you also had countless experiences where what you put into something greatly impacted what you got out of it? We've all had this experience, right? Maybe you take some class and you never show up never listen to the lectures, you never read anything, you don't study, and surprise, surprise, you don't learn anything, right? Or maybe you think that some social gathering is just going to be totally lame. So when you show up, you don't interact with anybody, you just stay in the corner by yourself, and what do you know? You have a terrible time. Or maybe the reverse. Maybe you really throw yourself into your work, right? Maybe you work hard to build strong relationships with your coworkers and your clients. Maybe you take advantage of opportunities for additional training, and you find yourself really beginning to have some success. You begin to move forward in your organization. See, even in our broken world, the principle of reciprocity often holds. But more importantly, it always holds with God. It always holds with God. In the end, God will always reward our perseverance, our faith, our love, our obedience. The principle of reciprocity always holds with God. Now, the gospel writers record these, um, this saying of Jesus in three different contexts, and I want to look at them one at a time. We'll start with the gospel of Mark. Jesus tells his disciples, Consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. This teaching comes on the heels of one of Jesus' most famous parables. Let's just read it quickly. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. So Jesus' message, he says, is like seed being scattered by a farmer. And this seed falls on four different types of ground. The path, the rocky ground, the ground that's filled with thorns, and then the good soil. And each of these places represents a different response to Jesus' message. Now, the seed falling on the path doesn't take root at all. This represents people who basically completely reject Jesus' message. Now maybe you've been there. Maybe, in fact, you're there right now. Maybe you're thinking, look, I don't want to hear any of this. I don't want to be challenged. I've tried all of that before. And you know what? I get it. 
I think all of us can feel a little disillusioned or cynical sometimes, especially with what we've been walking through the last couple of years. But I also know this, continuing to do exactly what you're doing right now is just going to continue to give you the results that you're getting in your life right now. If you actually want to move forward, you need some different inputs. Maybe you need some different relationships. Maybe you need some new challenges. And you know what? Jesus can help us but only if we listen and respond. The seed falling on the rocky ground looks a little more promising at first, right? The people respond to the message, they get excited, but it doesn't last very long, and they just fall away. Now, all of us can relate to this also, right? You wake up one day, and you look in the mirror, and you think to yourself, that's not good, right? So you decide, I got to do something about this. You know what? I'm going to start getting up at 5 a.m. every morning. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to run. I'm going to hop on that exercise bike. And you know what? You get after it. You're crushing it for like three days. And then it all wears off and you're right back where you started. You know what I found? Easy to start. It's hard to finish. It's easy to start. It's hard to finish, right? We just all run into obstacles at some point along the way. And many times when we hit those obstacles, we give up. Now, the third type of ground has thorns growing in it. The seed lands here. It springs up, but it doesn't end up producing any fruit because it gets choked out by all the thorns. Now, I found that one of the hardest things in life is keeping the main thing the main thing. Have you noticed this? Sometimes there's actually so much going on, it's difficult to figure out what the main thing should even be. I mean, maybe I should go back to school. Maybe I should start a YouTube channel. Or maybe I should remodel my apartment. Maybe I should put more attention on my relationships. Or give more time to my kids. Or maybe I should get into real estate. Or record some music, right? There's so many different distractions all the time. Our problem is not that God is not present Our problem is that we're distracted. We just miss it, right? We're preoccupied with everything else. Jesus calls it life's worries, riches, and pleasures. There's just always something else to give our attention to. Now, the fourth category of people are represented by good soil. This is the place where the seed takes root. People receive Jesus' message, and eventually they produce 30, 60, or 100 times what was sown. Now, it's important for us to notice something here. In each case, the seed is the same. The seed is the same. For most of us, exposure to the truth is not our problem. The issue is, what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? How are we going to respond? Are we going to be good soil kind of people? Do you know that there are things that you can do to make yourself a good soil person? I mean, for starters, you can get around other good soil people. I mean, this is going to make a huge difference in your life. Getting around other people who are putting into practice what you're hearing, who are actually living this out, is going to make it a lot easier for you to believe what you're hearing. Getting around other people is going to make it a lot easier to persevere when challenges come, right? You get that encouragement. You get that outside input. You get that accountability. We're way more likely to keep something a priority if we get around other people who are pursuing the same goal, who are talking about it, who are moving in the direction that we want to move. You know, at the end of last year, I knew we were coming into a new season as a church. I mean, the world was changing around us, we were changing, and I knew that I needed to get around some better inputs. So you know what I did? Two things. I hired a church consultant, and then I joined a coaching network for other pastors. I knew that if we were going to move forward into the new things that God had for us, I needed to educate myself. I needed to get around some other people. I needed some new inputs. Now look, we can do the same thing with the gospel. If you want the gospel to bear fruit in your life, get around some other gospel-oriented people, right? Very practically, this means things like jumping in our foundations class or joining a small group or serving on a volunteer team. Look, it's not about just more religious activity. It's about getting in the orbit of some other people who are pursuing God. This will make a huge difference in your life. 
Now, secondly, if you want the gospel to bear fruit in your life, you've got to keep listening to the message. You've got to keep listening to the message. You know, alcoholics who are trying to get sober are encouraged to go to 90 AA meetings in 90 days. People who are trying to get out of debt will oftentimes listen daily to like radio shows and podcasts about financial freedom. You know, I've been thinking a lot about how I can improve my relationships in my life. So I've been listening to a Christian psychologist named Henry Cloud basically daily now for months. Now, do you know what I found? Sometimes it actually takes months for the message to sink all the way in. I mean, we all know God can do something in a moment, right? He's a miracle-working God. He can do something in your life right now. He can start a process of change wherever you are. But I've also discovered that if I'm going to experience long-term transformation in my behavior, in my attitude, in the way I think, in the way I look at my own identity, I've got to keep this gospel message constantly before me. I've got to keep listening to this gospel message. You know, that's why one of our core practices of discipleship is read the Bible and pray every day. It's not about religious activity alone. It's about getting this message into our hearts and minds over and over until it really takes root and we start to bear fruit. Keep listening to the message. Now, thirdly, you may find that you need to restart as many times as it takes. Sometimes we just have to keep restarting. I mean, we all experience setbacks in this life. That's normal. Sometimes it happens on a daily basis. But the people who end up bearing fruit are the ones who respond to failure well. They're the ones who keep going even after they experience a setback. I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll get to the end of a day and I'll just think, that wasn't great. Today just did not go very well. But you know what? I can try again tomorrow, right? I can get right back at this. See, failure is almost never permanent. If you haven't prayed or read the scriptures for like a week or a month or a year or a decade, you know what? Today is a great day to begin again. We can restart as many times as we need to. Jesus says, consider carefully what you hear. Consider carefully what you hear. What are you doing with the gospel? How are you responding to it? The good news becomes good news for us when we respond to it. Now let's look next at the gospel of Matthew. In the gospel of Matthew, Jesus is teaching the crowds, and he says this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is so profound. There are two fundamental ways to approach this life. We can be people of condemnation, or we can be people of grace. We can be people of condemnation, or we can be people of grace. This is not about our temperament, not about our disc profile, or our strengths finder, our Enneagram number. It's not about how committed to truth we are. It's not about how responsible we are. No, it's about two contrasting ways of orienting ourselves to God and other people. We can be people of condemnation or we can be people of grace. You know, sometimes we miss the fundamental undercurrent that's running all throughout Jesus' gospel message. In fact, Paul highlights it in his letter to the Romans. He writes this, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God is for us. God is for us. This is the whole point of the gospel message, that God is for us. You know, that's what grace is all about. It's freely given favor. We do not have to convince God to act favorably toward us. In fact, way before we ever thought about living for him, God was already doing good things to us. This is how Paul puts it. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. 
Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know that God actually intends for us to grow up with this reality? I mean, think about it for a moment. When a child is born, he is completely helpless. He can't do anything for himself, and he certainly can't do anything for anybody else. And so what happens? In the ideal situation, parents sacrifice. They lay down their lives. Why? So they can take care of this child and love this child and provide all that this child needs. See, God has designed this. He's built this into the fabric of our human experience that way before we can do anything for anybody else, we're already receiving favor. We're already receiving blessing. We're already f- receiving love and provision in our lives. See, that's the nature of grace. It's freely given favor. That's what God extends to us our entire lives. I mean, now, of course, this does not mean that we never grow up or that we never have to take responsibility or that we never own our mistakes. Of course, we have to do those things. But what it does mean is that even when we do make mistakes, even when life isn't going how we think it should go, even when we're experiencing pain or experiencing obstacles or difficult circumstances, even in the middle of all of that, God is working good for us. God is working good for us. God is for you. God is for you. And one of the signs that we're genuinely receiving this gospel of grace is that we become people of grace. Two cannot be separated. One of the signs that we are receiving the gospel of grace is that we become people of grace. See, this is how Jesus knew that most of the Pharisees in his day had never really received the grace of God because they weren't gracious people. They weren't gracious people. In fact, on one occasion, a Pharisee named Simon could not see the grace of God that was at work in the life of a woman who had probably been a prostitute. But listen to what Jesus says. You see this woman, Simon? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. The more grace we receive, the more gracious we become. The more grace we receive, the more gracious we become. I want to encourage you to take a deeper drink of God's grace right now. I want to encourage you right now in this moment to receive God's grace in a deeper way into your soul. You know, you're accepted by God, loved by God. There's no condemnation for you. God is for you. He is working right now on your behalf. He's got a purpose for you. He's got a mission for you. He's got hope for you. He's got a future for you. This sink in. God has grace for you. God has grace for you. One of the great joys that we get in this life is the opportunity to act toward others how God has acted toward us. In fact, when Jesus is sending out his disciples to minister in the surrounding villages and towns, he says this, As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, so freely give. Freely you have received, so freely give. This is such a powerful way to live. You know, nobody else needs another person to condemn them, show them all the ways that they're wrong, to put them in their place. But you know what all of us could use? Somebody who's for us. Somebody who's cheering for us. Somebody who desires our good. The grace of God makes gracious people. The grace of God makes gracious people. We need to respond to the good news that God has given us by becoming people of grace. Now, Finally, let's take a look at the Gospel of Luke. Jesus tells his disciples, Give, and it will be given to you. 
a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. You know, I once had a dream about this verse. It's actually a little bit unsettling. In this dream, I'm working in what looks like a school cafeteria. I'm like one of the lunch ladies, you know, with the hairnet rocking and all that. I'm behind the line, and, um, and people are coming through the line, and I'm serving food to them. And I'm holding in my hand what looks like a measuring cup. And as they come through the line, I'm just divvying out food to them. And then all of a sudden, the tables are turned. And now I'm the one going through the line. And I'm watching them divvy out food to me, and they're using a cup that's exactly the same size as the cup I had been measuring out food to people. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking to myself, why didn't I use a bigger cup? I should have been using a bigger cup. It's all a little bit unsettling, actually. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, let's begin with the obvious here. The world will not always repay you when you're generous right? That's just reality. You're not always going to receive back from other people the generous things that you do for them. I mean, sometimes your boss will just overlook the fact that you've been covering for him. Or maybe your spouse will overlook how hard you've been working to make this marriage successful. Or maybe church leaders will just miss how much you've been investing to make the mission of the church go forward. You know, Jesus had this experience. Jesus had people that he healed, that he did great miracles for, who never even came back to say thank you. So people will take advantage of you. But don't let that change what is really an obvious thing still in this life. That generosity is conspicuous. It's conspicuous. It stands out. In this tight-fisted world we live in, generosity is conspicuous. Look, I know a lot of us want to make a big impact with our lives, right? We want to leave a mark on the world. And a lot of times we think we're going to do it maybe through our work or our creativity or our intellect, or maybe we're going to write some books or maybe start some businesses. And you know what? I hope that God does that through you. I hope he does it through me. But I know a guaranteed way to make an impact on other people in this world. Generosity. It's generosity. Generosity always leaves an impact on other people. You know, I'll never forget walking into the humble home of a couple named Jim and Selena. So Jennifer and I were recently married. We were just getting started in college ministry. We had no experience. We didn't really know anything about anything. We had this big vision from God. We're going to change the world. We're going to go on these college campuses and bring the good news to college students. And so we're sharing the vision with this couple. And again, you know, they've got this small, humble house. They've got young children of their own. And they make this commitment to us on this card of how much money they're going to give to us. And it was so much, I thought it was a mistake. I thought they meant like, oh, they'll give this to us one time, even though they checked this box that said, we're going to give this to you monthly. Do you know what? That's the commitment that they made. And over the years, they gave literally thousands and thousands of dollars to this ministry that we were engaging in. Because of their generosity, lives were changed forever. I will never forget it. Their generosity made a mark on me forever. Shortly before Jesus was crucified, woman came to him with an expensive jar of perfume, broke it, and poured it on her head. You know what? People noticed. In fact, it caused a little bit of a scene. Some people started complaining, this is such a waste. This is not how this should have been used. Listen to what Jesus says. Leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. You will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. People may have debated the prudence of her generosity, but it did not go unnoticed. Notice generosity. I love this scene in particular because it's such a powerful metaphor for us. Generosity always leaves an aroma. It always leaves an aroma, and not just with people, but with God. Measure you use, it will be measured to you. Here's my question for you. What are you doing with the gospel? What are you doing with the gospel? How are you responding to the gospel? 
News is just news until we do something with it. And what we've been unpacking in this message is this principle of reciprocity, that what we put into something is what we get out of it. In the world sometimes, with the people close to us pretty frequently, and with God always. You know what? That's not actually the whole truth. Listen again to what Jesus says. Consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And even more. And even more. God always goes beyond what we give to Him. In fact, the Scriptures show us He goes way beyond. Luke writes, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. We serve a gracious God. We serve a generous God. When we take a step in the direction of God. He meets us so powerfully. When we have just the smallest amount of faith, God does miracles on our behalf. When we take one step in the direction of righteousness, God begins to meet us with His power for Holy Spirit. He always does way beyond anything we will ever do. The grace of God. I want to encourage you to take a step toward God. Take a step toward God and watch what he will do in your life. Let's pray. God, I thank you that your love for us goes beyond what we can imagine. We cannot wrap our minds around how big your grace is. God, you are extending favor to us right now. Lord, you are more willing to give to us than we are to ask. So God, I pray right now as we take steps of faith, God, that you would meet us with your powerful grace. In fact, maybe you're listening to this today and you're thinking, I'm ready to take a step. I'm ready to take a step. I need the grace of God. I want to encourage you, if that's where you are, maybe just to pray a simple prayer. God, here I am. I need you. God, I'm putting my trust in you. Lord, I don't have it all figured out, but God, I know I want you. I know I need your grace. I know I can at least take a small step toward you. God, I'm asking that you'd forgive my sins. Lord, that you would do something new in my life. Father, I thank you. We pray these prayers. When we take a small step, when we reach out to get into community, when we reach out to say a prayer, to start reading your word, God, you meet us. Lord, you always do beyond what we can expect. Thank you, God, for your grace. We want to be gracious people. Shape our hearts, God, that we would be gracious people in this world, that just as we have freely received, that we would freely give. Thank you for your grace. Pray that it would be powerfully at work in and through our lives. In Jesus' name. God bless you, friends.